Lee Burns is an amazing leader. He's a great preacher from someone who's worked closely with him for many years. He's always inspiring, always chasing down new territory, always leading us to do more and more for God and building our lives and stretching us and growing us. And I'm sure you've enjoyed that benefit as well. But more than that, he's a great husband. He's a great father. As a Christian, he's the real deal. And he's got a great word for us today. So let's stand and give Lee Burns a phenomenal welcome. Hey, good morning. How are you all? How are you, Pebbles? Good. Very good. How are you both? How's the, how's the relationship? Is it going all right? Yeah, just checking out. Just checking. It's my job. I'm a pastor. Yeah, you guys look amazing. Hey, welcome to everyone watching through Brisbane, Melbourne, online, and Kiev. How awesome is that? And so, uh, so welcome to chapel. This is Chapel at Hills, and, uh, and I am going to come around the Word of God today. I'm going to pray and get started. Pebbles, why don't you come up and pray? Dear Jesus, this is a day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we're opening ourselves to what you want to do with us today. Thank you that it's never about us, but it's all about you. So, Lord, we're willing to be obedient vessels who respond to the supernatural. Bless the word. Thank you that it will fall into fertile soil. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Tell the person next to you, my goodness, you are good looking. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, band. You guys are awesome. Amazing. Hey, how are them cowboys going? How are we looking? We'll get there. We'll get there. The theme for this semester is advance, advance, and Rachel was definitely in the spirit, as was Robert Ferguson in staff meeting, as we come around and look at this, the spies, and one of my favorite Bible characters, Caleb. See, in 1997, how many of you weren't born in 1997, just out of curiosity? Yeah, there you go. You missed the greatest year in history. Stop. 1997, we moved into this building. This was our new auditorium. It was huge. We looked around and we went, how could we ever fill this place as a church? And it wasn't long until we started lining seats up here, the doors open, people going out into the foyer, people going out into the back foyer, people sitting up on the stairs, people up on the, uh, the, the first landing here, people going everywhere. I remember sitting there back in 1997 thinking, man, what am I a part of? Not having a real revelation of the church, I'd only been saved a couple of years at that point, or, well... Technically, probably one year. But I remember sitting over here, just looking out, going, wow, what an incredible auditorium, man. Who ever thought this could happen in Australia? Back then, I thought, if you're going to go into ministry, you have to be a senior pastor or a musician. I didn't want to be a musician. I was a musician. I played bass guitar in an Iron Maiden Metallica cover band. So I didn't want to do that. My days of that were over. So I thought the only other option is to be a senior pastor. And I sat up in this classroom up the back here on my right-hand side, and we were doing 
a subject on leadership, and in walked these two elderly gentlemen. One of them was a guy by the name of Serge Gagarik, and another one was a guy by the name of, not the one you're thinking though, Bill Johnson. And these two guys were just dead set legends on the Hills campus. They were amazing. And they came in, I had no idea who they were. They came into the classroom and Serge and Bill sat there and taught how Serge looks after all the new people, new Christians, looks after all the sick people in church, goes into hospital, sees miracles, healings, mourns with the funeral, uh, with the families when, they, when he does funerals, gets to do marriages. Bill told me all about the pastoral care that he does and his wife Betty, how he'd been married almost 40 years back then. I think they, I can't remember where they got to, it was in the late 40s. Bill's uh, passed away about, uh, about 10 years ago now. But they sat, and Bill would sit there and tell us how he chases Betty up the stairs all the time how he's always trying to bite her on the bum. And, and it was after 40 years of marriage, and I remember sitting there going, I want to be like that. This guy just become my hero. I wasn't married at the time, wasn't even dating at the time. But I just thought, I've met a lot of people that have been married for 40 years, and that's not what they want to be doing. But here's Bill in his later years, still got the vigor, still got the, the passion, the enthusiasm to chase Betty all around the offices. <laughs> but I remember sitting there thinking to myself, I have no idea who these two are, but I don't know that Hillsong Church would be what it is without them. And for me, it was one of those, I don't need to be a senior pastor. I don't need to be a senior pastor to make a difference. I've just got to know what God's called me to, to do and do it well. And maybe that's a word for someone in this room today. You've, you, you're sitting there going, I, this is the only thing that I think I'm called to do, but you, you're kind of in this conflict if I don't know that that's exactly what I want to do. Can I say this? If you're not called to be number one, be a number one, number two. Thank God for Pastor Brian. The guy is a freak of nature. Without a doubt, an incredible apostle of the church today, right across the earth. But the more I look at his life, the more I thank God it's not mine. <laughs> and the more I thank God I get to serve and build the kingdom with, such a, with a man like that. But there's this character in the Bible, his name's Caleb. He's my hero because he wasn't Joshua. The reason he's my hero is simply because he wasn't Joshua, but he was like Joshua. And so if you want a title for today's message, it's simply this, be bold. Be bold. Check this out, Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, it says this, the Lord said to Moses, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. Notice that, which I'm giving to the Israelites. There's the promise right there. Send men to spy it out, I'm giving it to them. It's done. Then Moses sent them, verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up there uh, into the Negev and go up into the hill country and see, the, see what the land is like. And whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether there are few or many, whether the land they live in is good or bad, whether the towns there are unwalled or fortified, whether they are rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or no trees in it. But be bold and bring some fruit of the land. Be bold and bring some fruit of the land. So that we know the story. The spies go up and they check out the land and they come back with this report. Verse 27. And they told Moses and the congregation, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey and this is its fruit. So they did what God had told them. Amazing. My translation says yet. The NIV says but. 
it's the same thing. So here's what God said, it's true. Then there's a 180 degree turn. But, here we go. Here's the real truth in their mind. Right? It's like when people come up to you, Lee, that was a great message, but. Yeah, all right. There's the, yeah, I get that bit. Here comes the real truth. All right? Just take the butt out, put an end in. Lee, great message, and. And you could have done that better. This is the fruit, but the people who live in the land are strong, and the towns are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And then down in verse 33, it says, there we saw the Nephilim, and to ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers. To ourselves we seemed small, and so we seemed to them. Now, I'm assuming they're spies. They went into the land. They didn't go in and tell the guys we're here. So how do they know how the other people saw them? Other than what they had inside them, they projected onto the people in front of them. Because we're small, surely they're also small. Surely they think that we're small. But listen to Caleb in verse 30. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. I like that. Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Here these spies come back, 10 of them go, the promise is good, but we are not able because they're big. Caleb comes back, the promise is true, and we are able. Notice the and aligned him with the promise of God. The but turned them from the promise of God. What do you lead with, your and or your but? When it comes to the promises of God, do you follow the promise with an and, or do you follow the promise with a but? Because here we have the spies, 10, we don't know their name, two, we all name our kids after them. Joshua and Caleb, when you see the promise of God, does it stir you up? When you read the promises of God for the church, does it stir you up? Does it produce boldness or timidity? You see, if we're going to be bold, we need to understand that Caleb was just a man. He saw what everyone else saw, but he didn't believe like everyone else believed. Caleb, I'm sure, saw exactly what they saw, the fortified cities and everything like that. And Moses said to them, tell me if they're weak or strong. And they actually come back with a report, they're stronger than us. Moses didn't ask them, come back and tell me if they're stronger than you. He said, tell me if they're weak or strong. And they come back, they're stronger than us. That's not what Moses asked for. Caleb comes back, yes, they're strong and we are able. Yes, they look big, but they don't have our God. Caleb comes back with boldness, looking at the fruit, going, there's so much more ahead for us. Three truths about boldness, and then I'm going to give you three things about great followers. Three things about boldness. Number one, boldness comes through obedience to the promise. Boldness doesn't come by simply receiving the promise. All Israel received the promise, it's been given to you. But boldness is, would not be a characteristic true of all of Israel, only true of two. And so boldness didn't come by simply receiving the promise, oh, God's got a great plan for my life. It came by actually obeying and stepping into the promise. By going out, spying the land, coming, coming back, God is right, let's go. And college, I find that boldness only stirs, stirs you up as you remain obedient to God. Timidity is easy. You don't even need God 
to complain about your city, about your town, about your nation. You don't even need the Holy Spirit to do that. But you do need the Holy Spirit to go, it looks impossible, therefore God must be in this thing. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to go after it and give it a go. So boldness comes through obedience. Number two, boldness comes by following the Lord. As Rachel just read out, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me wholeheartedly. I love Caleb. The reason he's my hero is this, because he was with Moses, Moses was his leader, and what the Lord had told Moses, Caleb went along with. Then the day came where Moses was no more, and Joshua was chosen, and Caleb, we don't find where Caleb sat there going, I thought I was the one, like, like I'm a little, little more gifted, right, remember when I did this, remember when, I, no, Joshua was the appointed man, and Caleb said, I'm still, still with you. I'm still in this thing. And the Lord said, I'm going to give it to you. And Caleb said, let's go get it. Notice that Caleb is aligned with what Moses heard the Lord say. So Caleb, his leader, and the Lord. Is everyone with me? And so Caleb comes back, goes back to his household. They begin to have a conversation and Caleb's got, to ask, Caleb's got to answer the question, will I be influenced or will I influence? Let me ask you, college, are you easily influenced or are you the influence? You go home, we're talking bad about the church. Do you get involved? Do you come down to the level of conversation or do you lift the conversation? Are you the kind of person when you walk into a room, you change an atmosphere? Influence or influenced? You stay aligned to your leader, which stays aligned to the Lord. You'll always be in a positive place of influence. You'll always be moving forward into all that God has for you. Number three, boldness comes by pleasing God. In this passage of scripture in chapter 14, uh, in verse 12, it says, this is the Lord speaking after the Lord speaking with Moses. He says, I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. And I'll make you a nation greater and mightier than they. And Moses pleaded with the Lord and said, no, don't disinherit them. You brought them out from Egypt. Come on, these are your people. And God said, all right, I forgive them. How do you want to live? By faith or forgiveness? You already have his forgiveness, 100%. But is it something that you've got to go for every day? You've heard me say it a thousand times, nothing wrong with having problems, just get new ones. You don't want to be fighting the same problem you were fighting two years ago. Come on, move on, step up. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Caleb, a man of faith, couldn't see the details, probably didn't know the details, but just thought, if God said it, I'm going after it. Boldness, boldness is what set Caleb and Joshua apart. Because of that, he had a different spirit because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. And the Lord says, I will bring him into the land in uh, in which he went and his descendants shall possess it. So all of Caleb's descendants will possess the land because of Caleb. What are you setting up for your generation? What are you setting up for your children? What are you setting up for your children's children? You see, what I love about Caleb is he wasn't the leader. He wasn't Moses. He wasn't Joshua. He was a great follower. But what I know is that great leaders are always great followers. So three things true of great followers. Number one, they follow the Lord. They follow the Lord. God said, The promise is yours. Caleb said, we are able. Listen to his confession. His confession is in line with what God said. His confession is not different to what God said. His confession is in line with what God said. Listen to this in verse 
uh, chapter 14, verse 28. This is what the Lord says to Moses. I will do to you the very things I heard you say. This is what Moses had to tell the people. I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. Israel's confession led them to never inherit the promise. Caleb and Joshua's confession aligned them to go in and inherit the promise. Where is your confession taking you this morning? Where is your confession leading you today? Because what you speak, you'll walk in. Always in the Bible, there is a strong connection between the heart and the mouth. And then the promise to inherit. So number one, follow the Lord. Number two, true of great followers, they follow their leaders. They follow their leaders. We always get this assumption that Moses and Joshua were perfect leaders. I don't know that they were. I don't know that there's any such thing as a perfect leader. I think it doesn't matter which leader you sit under, you're always going to see a better way to do something. But maybe that's why God brought you there. But often we see it as a, well, if I'm this good, I should be the leader. I remember years ago, and I've told this story a number of times, where I did get frustrated with my leader at the time. And I've got this theory that if I'm going to complain, I'll always complain up. I'll always complain to someone bigger than me. Right? It's easy to find agreement with, with, with all the small people because they're just going to, oh, yeah, oh, where with you, where with you, oh, great, right? I, I don't need that. I need someone to see my, my problem from a biggest and, and rebuke where rebuke is needed or challenge where challenge is needed. And so I, so I went up to this guy's office. His name's Darren Kiddo, and I went into his office. I said, have you got 15 minutes? And he said, yeah, go for it. I said, I'm just going to complain for 15 minutes. He's like, go for it. And so I'm just sitting there, blah, 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 and let, just letting it all roll out. He's on his uh, phone doing messages or whatever he was doing. He wasn't listening anyway, but it was just good to get it off my chest. And I got to the end of the, uh, got to the, end of the complaint, and I said, and the Hills campus would not be the same if it wasn't for me. <laughs> At least I'm being real. <laughs> yeah, none of you would say anything like that. Hills Campus wouldn't be what it is without me, talking about our college. And Darren stops text messaging and he looks up and he goes, Lindsay, you're probably right. It'd probably be bigger. <laughs> I just looked back at him with a huge smile on my face and went, that's why I came here. Walked out, everything was fantastic. You see, some of you get an attitude, and you go to other people with the same attitude. And all you do is end up with a bigger attitude. But you think because you've got a few in agreement, that it makes it right. But you've never asked someone bigger what they think of your situation, because it may bring challenge. You may be wrong. Oh, dang, that went quiet. I said maybe wrong. Just, just a possibility. I mean, it's not going to happen, but it's just a possibility. Align with your leaders. While you, during your time here in Hillsong College, go out and read the church that I now see. Get it, India. Because that's what Brian sees. It's a church that Brian sees. If you begin to see the same thing, you'll stay aligned with what we're doing during your time with us, during your season with us, however long that may be. Get, get the church that I now see, India. You see, I got to the point where I realized that I could do more staying faithful to a big leader than I could do alone. When I first came to Hillsong, Col uh, Hillsong College in 1997, we were one campus. We had a work going in Kiev at the time and we had a work going in London that were kind of not making any real significant impact or anything like that. Since that time, 22 years later, honestly, every Vision Sunday, I sit there sweating, thinking, oh my goodness, where are we about to go now? Where's, where's Brian going to send somebody now? 
what, what's the next city? What's the next nation? What, where, where? He's just a big leader. I can do more staying faithful to him than I could ever do alone. Great followers, number one, follow the Lord. Number two, follow their leaders. Number three, stay in church. Say it with me. Follow, follow, stay. Follow, follow, stay. Amen. Stay in church. Stay in church. Sometimes I think as Christians, you know, we've got, a, we've got our Lord and Savior who got pinned to a cross. And we sit there going, yeah, I want to be like that. I want to be more like Jesus. We sing songs, Jesus, Jesus, all I want is to be like you. Yeah, we're so sensitive and so easily offended. Just nudge, nudge the person beside you. Wake him up right now. What I love about Caleb, I'll get the band to come up and join me. What I love about Caleb is at this point, he's 40 years old. By the time we get to Joshua 14, which we're going to look at in weeks to come, he's 85. 45 years. He stayed with the church. Even when he was the one. I mean, God said to him, I'm going to disinherit these people and make a big nation. It was like God saying, hey, Moses, take Joshua and Caleb. We're going to make another church. We're going to start another denomination. And they said, no, we're going to stay true to these people. And Caleb stayed faithful for 45 years. I know some of you are looking at me like, well, that's easy. You're only 20. <laughs> you don't even know what 45 looks like. If you want to know what 45 looks like, here I am. This is what 45 looks like. <laughs> I know, it doesn't look that long, does it? Doesn't look that old. 45 years, Caleb stayed with this group and then went up and got the promise when he was 85 years old. 45 years of faithfulness. I do a message to our third years called Five Years of Faithfulness. I'm switching it now to 45 <laughs> years of faithfulness. Hey, can I ask you, Hillsong College, what do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for what you left or what God blessed? Follow, follow, stay. Follow, follow, stay. Turn to the person next to you and say, follow, follow, stay. I can get you all to stand in this place. Hillsong College, if we're going to be bold, Let's go after the promises of God that are before us. Let's put the negativity aside and let's go after all that God has for us. Let's go after continuing to see the church rise to be all that she's called to be. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your favor, and your blessing upon each and every person. Father, we pray for that Holy Ghost boldness, that Holy Spirit boldness, as we continue to go after all that you've got for us in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I pray for those that are called to be number one, Lord, that you would anoint them for it. But Father, for the rest of us, that we be anointed number one, number twos, as we continue to build the church, grow the church, and see the bride of Christ rise to be all that she's called to be on the earth. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, and your blessing upon each and every life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on. Let's go, Katie. I can surrender.